This next session is, is all about one, I think everybody understands in this, in this room, as you read the news, there are, you know, big swings in pipelines, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, rare disease is a very volatile state, there's, there's a lot of you know, drug development going on, um, you know, the investment in, in time, talent, and treasure for rare diseases, you know, is an episodic journey of, of um, you know, hopes and sometimes, you know, great sadness with drug development. And so one of the things I think when you we talk about from a drug development perspective, you know, obviously, you know, one of the things that's near and dear to CPATH is the tools we're, you know, that we work in are all aimed at de-risking, you know, drug development, rare diseases. And so, you know, the we wanted to have a session, you know, for someone that looked at, that has great experience in in uh, economics and financial modeling and and you know, give their perspective. And, and really you know, to discuss things that, you know, and c considerations around drug development, rare diseases, and we want to, to pass, and is, An is Andrew on the, on the line? Yeah. Wanna make sure, okay. Do you wanna go ahead and start his, and his uh, introduction? And, okay, thank you, Andrew. Do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself, and, and you can start your presentation. We're all excited to hear, and we're, we're thankful that you can join us, um, you know, remotely. Thank you. Oh, sure, thanks so much, Colin. First of all, I want to start by thanking Colin Hovinga and the CPATH for inviting me to participate in this meeting today. Uh, and I want to apologize for not being able to be there in person and uh, appreciate the opportunity to present remotely. Um, I, I don't know if the AV folks can highlight or spotlight my, uh, uh, my presentation because otherwise it'll be a little bit small since I'm not going to be sharing my screen in the conventional way. Um, after a, year, a couple of years of teaching online, I've uh, developed a different approach to doing online teaching using the so-called weatherman approach. This is the closest that we can come to to simulate my being there right with you. Uh, and uh, so I hope this is okay. And for those of you who are watching online, um, you may want to maximize my screen just so that you'll be able to see the slides. So I want to start with um, a little bit of a disclaimer, which is that I am not an expert in biomedicine by any means. I got interested um, really from my main field, which is applying mathematical and statistical models in uh, uh, various investment strategies, uh, hedge fund models, risk management, and so on. I got interested in healthcare really because of personal reasons. About uh, 15 years ago, a number of friends and family started dealing with various kinds of cancer. And through that process, I realized that finance plays a really big role in drug development, sometimes too big a role. So what I want to tell you about today is some of the research that I've been doing since then on applying the tools of modern finance to drug development issues. And uh, particularly in the rare disease space, that's going to turn out to matter a great deal. So let me start with an observation, which is that biomedicine is at an inflection point, And this audience knows this far better than I do. But the examples that I come up with are ones that I'm sure that you've come across as well, which is therapeutics that could not have existed even 10 years ago, that today is becoming routine. And I'm going to give you two examples. One has to do with these two kids, Caroline and Cole Carper. They were um, born with a single gene mutation that causes blindness starting at birth, Leber's congenital amaurosis. And um, this is a picture that was taken uh, shortly after their participation in a clinical trial that was uh, in May of 2016 by Spark Therapeutics for a gene therapy that would fix this genetic typo. And a few days after the gene therapy, this is what Caroline had to say. I went outside when it was snowing and I was like, oh, I can see the snowflakes. It was really cool to actually see something that I've never seen in my life before. And of course, in 2017, Spark Therapeutics treatment for this particular disease, Lux Turner, was approved by the FDA. The second example has to do with a company that's about three blocks from my MIT office, a company called Agilis Biotherapeutics. They were introduced to me because they had trouble raising funding for a gene therapy that they were working on, and I wrote a case study about them. A gene therapy is for a condition known as aromatic L-amino acid decarboxylase deficiency. It's a mouthful, and it took me an afternoon to figure out how to pronounce it. And, um, it turns out that this is a single gene mutation that prevents infants from being able to produce dopamine in the brain. And without it, they're not able to develop normal motor functions. 
turns out that a Taiwanese doctor by the name of Paul Hu developed a gene therapy to treat this particular disease. And what I'm going to show you is a video clip of patient number four, who was diagnosed at two years and five months. And what you're going to see is the patient before the gene therapy, so the baseline. And then you'll see that same patient after this one-time injection of this viral vector into his brain, a year later, and then two years later. So um, this is the baseline. And um, you'll see that the, the child is not able to raise his arms by himself. He can hardly breathe by himself, so he has a breathing tube. And he's not going to be able to roll over and do anything. This is what his life will be without, for the rest of his life. And now, the very same child, one year later, he's crawling. He's, uh, he's moving. He's, he's almost standing, not quite, because remember, it's only been a year since he's started producing dopamine in the brain. And uh, you know, as he tries to balance, you'll see that he's uh, not able to do that yet, but he's learning. And this is just a remarkable difference. Now, same child, two years later, after this one-time injection of the viral vector. And you can see that, that he's progressed. He's still not able to walk normally because it's only been two years now since uh, being able to produce dopamine. But this is just an extraordinary achievement relative to what his baseline was. The blind shall see, the deaf uh, shall, uh, sorry, the, the the deaf, uh, the, the, the lame shall walk and the blind shall see. This is the kind of typical, um, you know, religious uh, kind of experiences that are happening today thanks to these incredible breakthroughs that are being pioneered by people in the audience uh, and elsewhere. And so this is what I mean when I say that biomedicine is at an inflection point. My colleagues, Phil Sharp, Susan Hockfield, and Tyler Jacks, they wrote a monograph in 2016 describing this kind of, of uh, inflection point, and they call it convergence, the convergence of the life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. Other experts describe it as the so-called omics revolution. Every one of these omics has experienced tremendous advances over even just the last five years, never mind 10 or 20, with the exception of one. There is one omics that has been the bottleneck to progress in biomedicine, and what is that omics? That's economics, because you've got to pay for all of this stuff. And we're using these same business models that we've been using for the last several decades. So that's what I want to talk with you about today, is how do we change the landscape of funding so as to address the issues of the valley of death? Now, I have to tell you that when I first heard about the valley of death, I was a little puzzled. I was wondering, you know, is this in, where is this? Is Southern California? Well, well, why is this relevant for biotech? And then I realized what they were referring to is that a particular area between basic scientific research and getting drugs into patients in a phase one trial, that, that area of preclinical development is very, very difficult to fund. And so my question was, why? It shows you how naive I was. I just assumed back when I first started looking into this, that if there were some patients in need and we had some biomedical technology that could help them, that magically money would appear to fund it and they would get their treatments. And uh, I realized very quickly by looking at the situation with my friends and family that that was not the case. And after a number of years, I finally come to a conclusion as to why this is the case, why there is a valley of death. And it has to do with risk and uncertainty. Risk is the kind of randomness that you can predict to some degree, things like being able to calculate a normal distribution or mean and variance. And uncertainty is the, the, the randomness that you can't quantify, the unknown unknowns. And it's because of both of these features of biomedicine, the fact that they've been increasing in risk and uncertainty, not despite, but because of these scientific breakthroughs that has made it more difficult to fund early stage drug discovery. And so I'll give you an example of what the underlying financial motivations are. And you can start to think like an investor. And when you do, you'll realize immediately what the problem is. 
So for my first year MBA students, I give them the following example. I show them four different financial assets. I don't tell them what they are or over, over what time period they span. I simply show them what happens if you invest a dollar in each one of these and you leave it there for an unspecified multi-year investment horizon. The green asset turns a dollar into two dollars. Not very rewarding, but not particularly risky. The red asset turns a dollar into five dollars. Way more rewarding, but quite a bit more volatility. The blue line is the most rewarding of all. Extremely volatile, though. Way, way, uh, you know, big, bigger ups and downs. And finally, the black line is somewhere in the middle. So, by a show of hands, I'm going to ask you to pick one of these four investments for your retirement fund, for your kids' college education fund, for your parents' or grandparents' life savings. I want you to pick only one of these to manage your own personal financial assets. Which one would it be? Um, I'm not going to see you, but um, uh, the rest of the audience will. How many people, by a show of hands, would pick the green line? Any takers? Okay. How about the red line? How many people? Oh, wow, that's interesting. Um, so I'm going to have a few words about that. Not too many people raise their hands about the red line. When I tell you what it is, you're going to maybe want to call your broker. Uh, the blue line. Anybody for the blue line? Okay, those are the, those are the hedge fund uh, uh, wannabes and the, uh, the biotech startup uh, founders. And now how about the black line? Raise your hand. Anybody want the black line? So my guess is that, that this audience, as every other audience that I presented this to, the vast majority will pick the black line. When asked why, they'll say, well, it's got the best trade-off between risk and reward. It's not the most rewarding, but it's certainly less risky than many of the other examples. Well, so let me tell you what you all picked. First of all, the investment horizon is from 1990 to 2008. And the green line is U.S. Treasury bills, the safest asset in the world, at least for the next few weeks. We'll see what the budget discussions <laughs> look like uh, over the course of uh, the, uh, the, the coming few days. But assuming that we agree to pay our bills, U.S. Treasury bills are very safe. And if you had invested in that in 2008, you would have earned pretty much nothing. <laughs> the red line that most people do not pick, that's the U.S. stock market, the S&P 500. I suspect that most of you already have that in your retirement funds. So if you didn't raise your hand, you may want to do some rebalancing and call your broker and cash out and put it to something else. The blue line, which very few people pick, that's the single pharmaceutical company, Pfizer. Oh, actually, before I get to that, if you picked the S&P 500, you would have done just fine. So, you know, congratulations since 2008. But Pfizer, the single drug company that's way, way, way more volatile, if you had picked that in 2008, well, even bigger congratulations, you would have done spectacularly well, particularly through the pandemic because of the Pfizer-BioNTech combination. What about the black line, the most popular choice? Well, it turns out that that is the returns to a hedge fund known as Fairfield Century, which was the feeder fund for the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, which is why I had to stop it in 2008. Uh, that's, it, it, it blew up in that year. Like a moth to a flame, human nature is drawn to high-yielding, low-volatility assets. And in the case of the Madoff Ponzi scheme, now you know why it grew as big as it did because it just looked too good to be true. And the lesson is, sometimes in life, things that are too good to be true really aren't true. But on paper, it certainly looked really attractive, as you all saw from this audience's reaction. In finance, we have a way to describe this phenomenon. It has to do with a metric called the Sharpe Ratio, named after William Sharpe, the Nobel Prize winning economist at Stanford University. The Sharpe Ratio is simply the ratio of the expected return of an investment minus T-bills divided by the risk of the investment, in this case, the, re the standard deviation of the return, so that measures the fluctuations, exactly what you all were responding to. We are all drawn to high sharp ratio assets. We want a lot more bang 
for our buck. In particular, we want a lot more excess returns per unit risk. That's what we're looking for. And if you look at the sharp ratios of the S&P 500 and Pfizer, they're about the same. 0.43 for Pfizer, 0.54 for the S&P 500. And on paper, before Madoff blew up, it had a sharp ratio an order of magnitude higher. Clearly unrealistic, but before we knew it, we were all drawn to this investment opportunity. So why am I showing this to you? It's because biomedicine has had a decreasing sharp ratio over the course of the last couple of decades. Not because the numerator has been challenged. There are a number of very successful biotech companies that have earned great returns for investors. The problem is that on average, the denominator ends up being even larger. It's even more risky because we don't know who the winners are going to be. And it's that risk and the fact that the advancing technologies, the breakthroughs that many of you in the audience are pioneering on behalf of the rest of us, those are wonderful things for patients, but a, a, an incredible breakthrough can mean that an existing drug that investors are earning reasonable rates of return on will be made obsolete overnight. So when Zolgensma was approved by uh, the Novartis drug for spinal muscular atrophy, that was great for Novartis. It was great for SMA patients. Not so great for Biogen and their investors that created Spinraza a couple of years before that. So that's the challenge. And if there's one thing that I can tell you about investors is that they will vote with their dollars. They will put money into higher sharp ratio assets and take them out of lower sharp ratio assets. And where the sharp ratio is lowest is in the early stages of drug discovery, namely that area of the valley of death. Now let me give you another investment opportunity and see whether you like this any better. Imagine an investment where you have to give me $200 million. Not you individually, but you know, invest whatever you want, but I'm gonna raise a fund that's gonna have $2 million in it, and it's gonna take me 10 years to be able to generate any returns on that investment. And the probability that I generate any positive returns at all is 5%. 95% of the time, I will give you back nothing after 10 years, and that'll be the end. How many of you would you put your money in this by a show of hands? Well, I suspect that not too many of you. Now, when I show this to my MBA students, they have the same reaction that you do, not interested. But occasionally, I'll get one rather brave MBA student who will raise her hand and say, Professor Lowe, when you told us about this investment, you didn't tell us. In the unlikely event that there is a positive payoff, what is it? You see, most people don't need to know. When they see this, $200 million, 10-year waiting period, 95% failure rate, no thank you, not interested. It turns out that these are the back of the envelope numbers for what it takes to develop a single anti-cancer compound. It takes about 10 years to run the clinical trials. It takes about $200 million in out-of-pocket costs to pay for those trials. And the chances of success historically are actually a little bit less than 5%, 3.4% to be precise. I round it up just to make the numbers easier. But, in the unlikely event that you do succeed, it turns out that a single anti-cancer drug could generate, on average, about $2 billion a year in profits from years 11 to 20. Why 11 to 20? Well, because the patent life of a drug is about 20 years, and the first 10 years are taken up running clinical trials, so if you are lucky enough to get it approved in year 10, Starting in year 11, you will generate that $2 billion from years 11 to 20, and when the patent expires, you fall off that patent cliff, and now your profits are very, very much lower. This $2 billion a year from years 11 to 20, that is equivalent in financial terms to a single payday in year 10, if you get approved, of $12.3 billion. So let me ask you again, anybody in the audience 
are now interested in this deal? $200 million investment, wait 10 years, 95% of the time you lose everything. 5% of the time I'll give you a check for $12.3 billion. Any, any takers? My guess is that maybe a couple more people, a few hands, are interested in it. But this is still way too risky. In particular, if you do the, the math, the expected return during those first 10 years of investment is going to be about 12%. But the risk, the thing that goes in the denominator of the sharp ratio is 423.5% volatility. So this is a sharp ratio of 0.02. No, thank you. Not interested, right? So this is where finance can actually do something. Now, the, the failure that's going on here, if you ask what the failure is, it's really the fact that you're getting hit with a triple whammy of this kind of an investment. The horizon is too long, the costs are too high, and the probability of success is too low. And when you have all three of these things in one particular investment, I call that a long shot. Now, long shots can be very, very profitable. They can actually be very beneficial to society, but they are just very difficult to get investors interested in putting money up to invest in it. So what do you do? Well, the answer comes through a, a long, long list of biomedical research papers that I've published. And let me just tell you what we need to do. Two things. We need to increase the numerator of the Sharpe ratio and or we need to decrease the denominator. That's it. It's as easy as that. Now I say easy. How do we do that? All of you, what you are doing, what CPATH is doing is exactly this. What you're trying to do is increase the numerator and decrease the denominator. What I want to show you now is a very simple financial engineering tool that can do the same thing. So instead of investing in one of these programs, what if we invested in, oh, I don't know, 150 of them all at the same time? That's a lot of programs granted, and it's going to cost us a lot of money. It's going to cost us $200 million times 150 programs, or $30 billion. Where are we going to get $30 billion? And as an economist, I have a very simple answer. The answer is, assume we have $30 billion. <laughs> now, you may, you may be skeptical of that, but I'll come back to where I'm going to get it in a minute. But assume I have it. Assume I have $30 billion. And assume further that the programs are statistically uncorrelated. What I mean by that is that the success or failure of one program has nothing to do with the success or failure of a different program. Now, I know that's a tall order, especially in oncology, because if you've got you know, five angiogenesis uh, inhibitors and one of them fails and they're all targeting the, particular, the same particular mechanism, if one of them fails, that's not good news for the other four. But, but bear with me for a moment. If they are statistically uncorrelated, then when I look at the economics of this particular portfolio, well, look what happens. The standard deviation is going to decrease at the rate of the square root of the number of programs. So now my sharp ratio is 0.34. Remember before this, it was 0 0.02. 0 0.02 to 0.34. So now let me ask the audience, how many of you, by a show of hands, would invest in this portfolio? I suspect we have a lot more hands up. And that's where I'm going to get the 30 billion. Not for me. I don't have it. I'm going to get it from you. If I can change the economics of this particular investment, I can crowdsource this on steroids. I can get large amounts of capital to flow into these investments if I can change the economics. Now, can we really raise $30 billion? And the answer is, it depends. It depends exactly on the measurement of the various different risks and rewards of these portfolios. 
when I published this paper, one of the things that I was prepared for was skepticism. And it turns out that there is one area where this assumption of uncorrelatedness can actually be defended. Because that's one of the weakest links in this argument. It's, you know, this kind of uncorrelated nature allows you to really de-risk the portfolio, but is it likely to happen? It turns out that it is in rare diseases. You all know that there are over 7,000 different rare diseases, and many of them have nothing to do with many others because they're so different in terms of their causes, their mechanisms of action, the, inner, the way that we interfere with these diseases. And so for a variety of reasons, it turns out that from a financial perspective, the economics actually works quite well for rare diseases, but largely for one very important reason that has nothing to do with science or medicine. And that is what I just described, which is the uncorrelatedness of the different diseases. Now, it's not always true. You, for example, in the cases of Leber's congenital amaurosis and um, uh, AADC deficiency, they're very different. But if you use the same viral vector, in both those cases, it was AAV9 that was used. And it turns out that there's an immunogenic response, as there was when Bluebird was applying it for one of its diseases. The FDA will put a hold on all AAV9 therapies. And so there is correlation that you have to manage, but we know how to do that. There are so many different ways of treating these different diseases, whether it's through ASOs, gene therapy, gene editing, small molecule drugs, uh, radiation, many, many different approaches. It is actually possible to construct an uncorrelated portfolio of rare diseases. So I wrote a paper about this in 2015, published it uh, with some collaborators from the National uh, Institutes of Health, the uh, NCATS in particular, uh, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. They have a rare disease unit. And we simulated a portfolio of rare disease therapeutics and found that that portfolio would not only be successful at developing a number of drugs, but it would generate a rate of return on the order of 22% per year for the life of that particular fund. Now, this is a theoretical finding, and so undoubtedly you might be skeptical. And there were a number of people that, that were. But one of my former students from MIT contacted me. He read the paper, and uh, he um, said, first of all, I, I, I really like your analysis of rare disease therapeutics with these uh, portfolio kind of diversification arguments. But um, would you mind rerunning your analysis with my assumptions instead of yours? Because obviously, the parameters that I had used for running the simulations were from the industry publications. I had no particular expertise in the area. Um, the work that I did with NCATS, they used their data and then industry figures. We used his figures instead. And over the course of six months, we must have run 35 additional simulations. Each time, the results kept getting better and better and better. And one day, he came into my office about six months after we started this exercise. And he said, I just wanted to let you know, I quit my job yesterday. I'm going to do this. I'm going to build this company. And I got to tell you, that freaked the heck out of me. I, uh, <laughs> I never had that effect on any student before. And uh, you know he had a young child in his household. So I said, Neil, you sure you want to do this? Maybe you better let me run a few more simulations. And he said, no, 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 I'm really excited about it, ready to do it. I felt guilty enough that uh, I invested a small amount of money in the uh, friends and family round. And in retrospect, I wish I had uh, invested a lot more. Because um, the company called Bridge Biopharma uh, has its business model focused on rare diseases. And um, shortly after we came out of stealth mode in 2017, we raised $40 million from investors because of that portfolio structure. A year later, $135 million. Uh, a year later, $300 million. Um, and uh, in 2019, we did an IPO, the largest uh, a biotech IPO uh, at that time, um, and uh, also raised some debt financing. And as of a couple of days ago, the uh, 
market cap of Bridge Bio is a little bit more than four and a half billion dollars. Not bad for a, a seven year old company. But this is not what Bridge Bio is most proud of. What the people and I are most proud of is this. It's the fact that Bridge Bio now has a pipeline of more than a dozen assets in a variety of different rare diseases. And in 2021, it received its first FDA approval for a drug for cholangiocarcinoma and another one for uh, a particular kind of uh, 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 enzyme deficiency and um, breakthrough designation for other diseases. And just uh, recently, um, a very big phase three readout for uh, a, a disease uh, that affects the heart, uh, transthyretin cardiomyopathy. Without the portfolio approach, it would have been difficult to convince investors to be able to fund it. But with the right structure, with the right kind of financing, uh, it is possible. Now, there are other business models that have emerged, including venture philanthropy. Uh, and in a paper that I published in 2022 on using different models like the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, multiple myeloma, and so on and so forth, there are ways for public and private organizations to work hand in hand. And a really wonderful example of that is what you are all doing at CPATH. This is a great example of increasing the Sharpe ratio by basically convening various different stakeholders and generating data. So I, I, I want to give uh, great kudos to all of you at CPATH for doing what you're doing and uh, you know, would love to support it in any way that we can at MIT. So let me wrap up and leave a little bit of time for Q&A if there is some, um, by pointing out that I started down this path for personal reasons. And um, over time, it's become even more personal as I've seen just how important this, these kinds of financing models are for helping patients. This was brought home to me in a very, very concrete way by one of my colleagues, Harvey Lodish, at MIT. Harvey is a cell biologist at the MIT Whited Institute. And when I first met Harvey and heard about his story, I decided right then and there, I want to be Harvey Lodish. <laughs> and when I tell you his story, you're going to want to be Harvey Lodish too. In 1983, <clears throat> Harvey was an assistant professor here at MIT and was approached by some of his colleagues to help them work on a disease known as Gaucher's syndrome. So Gaucher's is also a single gene mutation. It prevents your body from producing important housekeeping enzymes, and without it, fatty acids build up in your organs, in your bone marrow, and by the time you're a teenager, if you have a particularly serious variant of this disease, you're dead. So this is not a small problem for the people that are afflicted with it, and in 1983, Harvey and his colleagues started out to develop what ultimately became the very first enzyme replacement therapy, which was Seridase, approved in 1991. Um, and that drug and all of its various improvements have saved literally hundreds of thousands of lives for patients that have Gaucher. And uh, you might have heard of Harvey's little startup. It was called Genzyme. And in 2014, it was acquired by Sanofi for about $20 billion. Now, that's not why I want to be Harvey, <clears throat> although that's not a bad reason, uh, particularly you know, as an economist. I, I applaud that. What I want, what, the reason I want to be Harvey Lotus is what happened in 2002. You see, in that year, Harvey's daughter was pregnant with her second child, Harvey and his wife's second grandchild, a boy named Andrew. Great name, by the way. <laughs> Andrew was diagnosed with Gaucher's in utero. What are the chances of that? And so I, I asked Harvey, you know, it was a very emotional conversation. I asked him, Harvey, did you know, did you know in uh, 1983 that you would be helping to develop the drug that would save your as yet unborn grandchild? And Harvey said, no, I had no idea. You know, in 1983, it was 20 years before we even sequenced the human genome. I didn't know that I was carrying the gene for Gaucher's. I just thought if I could do some cool science and help some patients, you know, that would be great. And so in 2012, when Andrew turned 10, he developed the full-blown symptoms of Gaucher, but he's leading a totally normal, healthy life thanks to the drug that Grandpa helped to develop. This is why I want to be Harvey Lodish. 
I will never be able to develop a drug that will save my as yet unborn grandchildren. But I realized something. I realized that all of us, we can all be Harvey Lodish if we invest in the drugs that will save our as yet unborn grandchildren. Finance doesn't always have to be a zero sum game if we don't let it. With the right kind of business model, the right kind of science and medicine, the right kind of financing at the right scale, we can all do well by doing good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with your help at CPAP, we can do it now. Thank you. Um, I guess, do we have any questions from the audience for Andrew? Anyone? Anybody there? Investment fund strategies? Okay, you guys here. <laughs> Well, you just have to tell us what you invest in right now. <laughs> uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, <laughs> two things. One, my retirement funds are, uh, all of them, invested in low-cost, low-fee mutual funds at Vanguard, and usually broad, diversified portfolios like the S&P 500 or the international <laughs> version of the S&P 500. My other uh, investments are all in the area of healthcare. I'm investing in biotech companies, like Bridge Bio, but, but others. And that's very risky. But my retirement, not at risk. I know I'll be able to retire and be able to you know, uh, you know, buy ice cream cones for my grandkids. But the area, the, the money that I can afford to lose, I'm investing them now in biotech companies that are really risky, but have the opportunity to transform people's lives and if they do, they'll make a lot of money for all investors. So I want to say thank you for making drug development sound fun and funny. <laughs> That's not how we live, but okay, sure. Um, <laughs> but one thing I do want to say is, I, I mean, I know Harvey, and I know that story, and he, that was the best story until Bob Langer, right? Moderna. Yes. Like, he yes. cried at the idea of the vaccine, but... I mean, I really appreciate this story, and I wish you would teach that to all your other friends and family at academia, because we still have that battle trying to appreciate the value of what we're doing. I know, and, and you know, um, if, if I were there in person, I, I would have spent a little bit more time on the introduction part. It's a little hard when I can't see the audience, but I start almost all of my presentations first by thanking the audience for doing what you do, because it's not something that I can do, and you guys are all saving lives, um, and it, it's really important for the rest of us. So I'm very grateful for that, and it, a day doesn't go by when I, when I don't realize just how uh, amazing uh, this profession is. And that's one of the reasons why you know, most of my research is now devoted to healthcare finance, because this is sort of the least I can do to help all of you do what you, you can do. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, this was a really interesting intellectual exercise. Thank you so, <laughs> for that. Um, and going back to the economics, just I was thinking, um, obviously, when you gave the first example that you invest 200 million on a risk asset and then your potential reward is 2 billion a year, right? Um, and then obviously, you multiply it by 150 investments to reduce the risk. But when you go into the rare disease space, um, we're talking about small populations. So right. to attain your potential target, um, likely drug prices will be over the roof. So how do you expand on the economics of that? Well, actually, so there are a couple of different factors that are important to keep in mind for rare diseases. One is that it doesn't require $30 billion. So I didn't have a chance to get into the details. But precisely because you have smaller patient populations, what that means is that running a clinical trial isn't 200 million, it's more like you know, 10 or 15 million. Uh, and uh, so the economics actually changes all the way around. Now, you do bring up an important point, which is prices. It is true that rare diseases, in general, have higher price tags than uh, more common diseases. But the reason is actually pretty straightforward. It's because it costs a certain amount to do the research. And whether or not you're developing a drug for a rare disease or a common disease, apart from things like infectious diseases where you need 30,000 patients for a phase three trial, apart from those examples, 
the cost is not that different for developing a, a drug for a rare or common disease, except for the numbers of patients in the clinical trial. So what that means is that when you have small patient populations, it costs less to develop the drug in terms of the clinical trial, but you're also going to earn less because you've got fewer patients. So what do you need to do? You need to increase the price per patient. And that's what Genzyme figured out. You know, prior to their launch of an enzyme replacement therapy, nobody would dare charge two or $300,000 per patient per year. But they, they said, look, if you want to save these lives, this is what it costs to develop the drug. This is what we need in order to earn a reasonable rate of return. And meanwhile, we are actually saving lives. You know, this is not toenail fungus treatments. We're talking about life or death. And so from an economic point of view, it actually is a reasonable trade-off to be able to pay those prices to save those lives. So I, I would say that actually the, the, the prices of these gene, uh, gene therapies and other rare disease uh, therapeutics, they're actually not nearly as problematic for payers and for the government, for politicians. They're not nearly as problematic as the price of insulin, uh, which you know, is, is really outrageous. It's, you know, insulin's been around for a long time, and you know, there are people that this is not a rare disease. A lot of people get affected by that. Do you have a question? Yeah, that's a great, great question. In fact, AI is changing the Sharpe ratio as we speak, uh, not necessarily through the numerator, but through the denominator. So as I suspect this audience knows far better than I do, there are a number of AI companies out there that are engaged in drug discovery. And what they're able to do is to be able to identify targets that previously we were not able to identify as easily. And in some cases, they can predict toxicity in ways that existing methods don't predict. Uh, there are a couple of case studies that I know of, of um, situations where you can use um, these kinds of AI tools to predict toxicity in humans, where animal studies have shown that there isn't any toxic effects. So I think it's really remarkable what we're seeing right now with the power of AI, and certainly with programs like AlphaFold that are being able to generate you know, three-dimensional structures for proteins on demand. I think that we're in this inflection point for at least another five or 10 years where we're gonna see some tremendous progress uh, and, and therefore benefits uh, from the financial side for investors in that time frame. Uh, last question. Going back quickly <clears throat> to the question about payers, uh, particularly in long lasting therapies like gene therapies, if you mentioned that payers may have less of a problem with the cost, but when in our healthcare system you're switching insurance companies and a company is yeah. investing in you $3 million for a treatment that they may not see the return, how do you see that playing within the economics of rare disease drug development? So that's a fantastic point to end on because there is a problem, a really serious problem, and I believe I have the solution to that problem. So what, what this uh, questioner was referring to is the fact that a gene therapy like uh, hemogenics, that's the gene therapy for hemophilia A, that's currently the most expensive drug on the market and the most expensive drug in the history of the biopharma industry. Three and a half million dollars to cure you of hemophilia. Now it turns out that that's actually a bargain in the sense that hemophilia patients need to be treated now anyway. And you know, one episode of a bleed and infection can actually cost, in terms of hospitalization and other treatments, it can actually cost about $900,000 for that one episode. So, so hemophilia patients are actually uh, going to do better by the healthcare system if we were able to cure them. But the problem is that upfront payment can hit employers and insurance companies really, really hard. So there's a solution. The solution is, instead of charging a single upfront price, what we ought to do is to create a Netflix model, the kind that was used by Louisiana for Solvaldi and Harvoni, where you basically charge everybody in the healthcare system a small amount every month for the privilege of receiving hemogenics at no additional cost should you need it. That subscription model 
is now currently being developed by a startup that I co-founded a couple of years ago called Quantile Health. And right now, it's not as big of a deal because the existing gene therapies are for relatively rare indications. But we have a gene therapy. We have two gene therapies in the works for um, sickle cell uh, by um, uh, Bluebird uh, and uh, by Vertex. And so when those get approved, and they looks like they will get approved, this is not going to be a small problem. So the subscription model will provide a way for, to make it affordable and to make it broadly accessible. OK, now I'll close the session. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope family is all doing well. And I look forward to speaking again shortly. Take care. Thank you. And thank you all at CPAC for doing what you're doing.